The voice of the consumer is what makes or breaks a business. And so I always want to feel like we've got the consumer on our side. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm thrilled to have my next guest here. We have Seth Goldman, who is the co-founder and CEO of Eat the Change. Uh, I actually know Seth from very long ago when we <laughs> shared a distributor um, in New York City, uh, Big Geyser, and we used to see each other as we were getting there early in the morning to get those cases on the trucks uh, to go out to New York City for everyone to drink when he was uh, at Honest and very, very thrilled to get him on the show today to hear about his journey. Not only is he the co-founder of Eat the Change, but the co-founder of Plant Burger and chair of the board of Beyond Meat. And so he has incredible experience, and we're going to hear a lot more about what he's done to not only create these incredible companies, but also um, just the overall his mission to really help the planet change it for the better, and uh, by doing that with incredible products and, in some cases, incredible entrepreneurs as well. So thanks for coming on, Seth. Great to be with you, Kara. So nice to <laughs> reconnect after uh, those days at Big Geyser. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, we both used to see each other at the distributorship in New York, uh, the good old days. But um, before you created um, that success and sold it, share a bit more about who was Seth Goldman as a kid? I was certainly active. I was doing all types of different activities. I was in singing groups and sports teams and student government. And I realized at the time in musicals, um, I, so I was kind of a multitasker uh, even at an early age. And yeah, I probably did some studying along the way as well. But my mother, my parents were both academics. And so they were often, I don't want to say critical, but surprised that I wasn't spending as much time in my schoolwork as I was in doing all these other activities. But I did take those activities seriously. So for me, that was... Um, you know, work as well. I think the other piece is I always thought of myself as an activist. And what I mean by that is issues I care about, I really want to do something about. And so I've found a way in all the work that I've done to um, make sure that it's purpose-driven work, you know, um, whether it's about the environment or about labor conditions in the developing world and, or about diet. These are things that I um, ingrain into the purpose of the businesses. So I think of myself, I guess, as an activist in an entrepreneur's body. That's incredible combo for sure. And I definitely <laughs> saw that when you were uh, running Honest Tea. But share a little bit more about where did the inspiration come for come from for that company? Well, I was at a stage where I was really eager to find the right idea. I, I knew I wanted to go create something. I was working in a uh, a mutual fund company in Bethesda, Maryland. And I enjoyed the work. It was a, it was called Calvert and they did socially screened investments. So they weren't investing in tobacco or companies with bad environmental records. And I enjoyed that work, but it was kind of passive. It, you know, I, I said, rather than be the investor, I want to be the actor. I want to be the activist who's, you know, helping create different models and helping change behavior. So I was just trying to find the right business. I actually got to a place where I actually had a few different ideas, and I'll share them with you since you're an entrepreneur and can appreciate it. One idea was to launch an organization that helped public schools raise money from alumni, right? So when we look at, you think about how private schools raise ridiculous amounts of money, especially high schools, um, from their alums. And there's, there's more wealth held by the alums of public schools. They just never have a way to organize it. And so that was an idea I was sort of noodling around. Another idea was for a, um, a, a diagnostic company. When I was at the Yale School of Management, a friend of mine and I had developed a, a business plan that had won a competition. And so could we sort of commercialize that? And then um, kind of out of nowhere, I went to give a presentation in New York City on behalf of the mutual fund company about socially responsible investing and after the presentation, I went for a run in Central Park. And after the run, I went to a beverage cooler and I said, wow, there's nothing here for me. And this was this was before honesty and hint existed. So you know what that beverage cooler looked like. And I and I said, this is something I could actually get excited about. And I reached out to my professor from business school, Barry Nailbuff. And, and when I had been his student, we had 
done a case study of the beverage industry. And we, we both agreed there was something missing. And so that was kind of the catalyst for me to take action. I reached out to Barry and he had just come back from India where he had been studying the tea industry and among other things had come up with the name Honest Tea. And that kind of crystallized for me this idea of how to ingrain purpose into, into a brand around tea and a less sweet drink. And then from there, I left my job in the investment world and started out of my house and you know started brewing tea in the kitchen. And our first break was getting an appointment with Whole Foods in the Mid-Atlantic. And I had five thermoses of tea that we had brewed and, and I got an empty Snapple bottle I pasted a label on and presented it to the buyer and got that order for 15,000 bottles. That's so wild. Oh my God, that's such a great story. And you guys write about that in your book, Mission in a Bottle, that I've read a couple of times. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> actually, I've gotten to know Barry a little bit as well. And, and right. um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really incredible book that uh, you should pick up definitely if you have not read the book. It really shares a lot of the story in a very fun way, actually. Yeah. So I It's a comic book. So so we really wanted to make it have a wide appeal, not just be a sort of standard text. What did you think? I'm so curious. When you first started Honest, did you think, OK, it's a couple years and we're going to be off to the races or? <laughs> you know, we hadn't done this before, so we didn't know what to think. Um, we, we knew what we wanted to build. We knew, um, the, the scale of the ambition for the, for the brand. We didn't know how to get there. Um, and so, you know, as I'm sure you, you learned it, it, distributors play a really important role and we hadn't really, and didn't really even understand that role when we started. So I, I guess we just felt like, let's just build something that's meaningful to us and that connects with consumers. And then, um, sort of underneath that, there's a whole lot of work that has to be done. And we, we, we figured it out along the way. But um, you know what's interesting about the beverage industry is that so many of the successful brands are, are created by people who never were in the industry before, you know, just like you, right? And because it starts from a vision that is sort of outside the industry. And there is a lot to be learned along the way and a lot of pain points around production and around distribution. But I think that vision entering is just so important. And, and that's kind of we knew we knew what the vision was. We didn't necessarily know how to get there. Yeah, definitely. I mention it just because whenever I meet with entrepreneurs, and I'm sure you do as well, when I see a plan that says, oh, in four years, we're going to sell the company. And oh, it, yeah. It, no, <laughs> nothing like that. It's no. just, I mean, time flies uh, for sure. And, uh, you know, I think the main thing is to focus on the progress that you're making along the way. Yeah. And I totally agree with you. I mean, how many people, uh, you know, Jerry Kamuch, who writes an incredible uh, newsletter called Beverage Business Insights. I remember meeting him at the first trade show and he heard we were from tech and he said, you guys are going to be roadkill for sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and I, now I, I remind him of that every time I see yeah. him. And, and um, you know, definitely yeah. I think that it's the people to worry about are the ones that really like are the underdogs that more than anything yeah. that have an idea to change something that they really yeah. believe. I mean, you guys in the unsweetened tea um, industry and, and I'm so curious, like, what did you learn from building Honest? And like, maybe what do you regret? What do you think about in that company that you, that <laughs> when you built it, that yeah. years later you regret? The only real thing I regret, and we tell the story in the book, is that for six years we owned a bottling plant or a portion of a bottling plant. And it was the six longest years of my life because... It was um, it was in Pittsburgh, and it you know which is about four hour drive from where I am in Bethesda, Maryland, and I would usually go there and back in a day. So I would have these grueling days, and all of that energy was focused on um, work that, first of all, I wasn't particularly well you know good at. I wasn't um, passionate about, and wasn't building my brand. And it was only after we divested the bottling plant that our growth really started to take off. So for, for me, it was a really important lesson in you know, my leadership, how I spend my time. I've got to do things that I'm passionate about, that I'm, it doesn't have to be, I, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to learn new skills. I need to learn you know, new skills and be able to adapt. But you know, the, the work at the bottling plant was how do we um, optimize production? How do we find ways to um, you know, get, uh, parts at a low price. It just wasn't, and it was real work, 
But it wasn't any of the work that when I signed on to build a brand, I was, you know, particularly excited about. And so eventually, you know, we ended up selling the plant or, or what was the assets of the plant to uh, someone else who took it over and has done quite well with it. But um, for me, the, the real lesson there was make sure you're doing the work um, that you're passionate about that builds your brand. And basically all the rest is kind of can be a distraction. And so, uh, and the other lesson, and this is something I still very much think about, is the biggest asset um, that I have that I bring to, to a company is my energy. It's not necessarily my time uh, because I was still working on the, you know, the, 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 the company when I was driving there and back, but I it was draining my energy. And so I had, in order for me to be fully present and engaged and excited about the business, I had to not be involved in that bottling plant. And so that was also a really important lesson. And it, it certainly made me feel better about, you know, I, um, I continue to exercise a lot. And for me, it's great. I know, I know it's actually good for the company when I do it, because I've got to make sure I have enough energy to, to really um, inspire and excite the rest of the team. Great lessons in there for sure. So you sold Honest to Coca-Cola and you stayed yeah. on for a bit to help. Well, for eight, for eight years. Oh so my we, gosh, we, I didn't uh, realize yeah, it was that right? long. Wow. Yeah. So Coke invested in 2008 and then they bought the company in 2011. But we created an arrangement where I actually held on to a piece of the company through uh, basically 2019. And so um, I still very much acted as if I was, you know, the owner of the company. And, and even, even though I'm no longer uh, connected, I still <laughs> feel a good sense of ownership of honesty. And I, um, in a hopefully a friendly way, I still send notes to the brand manager when I, you know, see our product missing on a shelf where it's supposed to be. And, uh, you know, my name is still on the bottle and I still feel that sense of, of ownership. I love that. What do you think is the key thing that entrepreneurs can learn from your experience, you know, integrating your company into yeah. a large company? I really do think the, um, the entrepreneur's presence continues to be important. Um, obviously, most of the time, a com an entrepreneur will, you know, the company will be sold and the entrepreneur may have a few months. Uh, as one friend put it to me, he said, well, for the first few months, they want to know what you think. The next few months, they want to know your phone number. After that, they don't want to know you. Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and I think it's too. actually, yeah, but it's also, it, it depends on the stage of the company. So for an early stage company like Honest Tea, it was really important for me to continue to, to be there and to help shape and, and make sure that the brand and the business made decisions consistent with what we were trying to do. It was too uh, um, formid too in um, easily influenced if, if I wasn't there to stand up for things. And there were plenty of times when I did have to sort of literally meet with the you know, president of Coca-Cola North America and say, we, we should not do this or, or we should do this. And so by the time I left in 2019, the brand was more formed and, it, and, and all of the things that stood about were kind of guardrails that had been fully established. And so, you know, today I'm still very proud of the brand that Honesty is. It's still, you know, fully organic and fair trade certified for, for the tea. Um, and the kids product is, you know, organic and lower calorie. So those things that, that, that uh, we work to embed in the brand are there and they're not, they can't really be compromised because they're, they're, that's what the brand is. Really interesting. So you left and then I don't know if I have the timeline exactly right, but I just, all of a sudden saw you as the chairman of a company called Beyond Meat and, yeah. uh, and one of the most successful IPOs um, of that year, definitely. Did I miss anything in between there? Or how did you get <laughs> well, to Beyond Meat? Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. So I'll, I'll take a few steps back. Back in 2002, um, I got my first chance to get involved in a, another company besides Honest Tea, and I joined the board of a company that was just for me called Happy Baby. Um, which are, um, and uh, two wonderful uh, entrepreneurs building that business. And I really enjoyed the work as their, a board member there, their first board member and advisor. And, and um, that was got my first chance to have a toe sort of beyond honesty. And I enjoyed that. And then they sold uh, to Danone, I think around 2011-ish or 12. And then I thought, well, okay, what would be another way I could get involved and in 2012, my wife read an article about this company getting started out in California called Beyond Meat. 
that was seeking to replicate the taste and texture of meat using only plants. And our family has been vegetarian now for 16 years, but at the time we were vegetarian and often um, disappointed with the choices. Never, never regretted the decision, but felt like sometimes <laughs> veggie burgers just were disappointing. And so I sent an email to info at beyondmeat.com and said, you know, if there's any way I can help, I, 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 you know, be happy to talk. And I got an email back pretty quickly. They needed help in a lot of different ways. And so I became an advisor, board member. And then this is what's unusual. In 2015, I was able to create an unusual arrangement where I worked halftime for Honest Tea and then halftime as executive chair of the board of Beyond Meat. And so for those next five years, I was able to, to play both roles. And um, there was a lot of growth. You know, when I joined Beyond Meat uh, in 2000, as a board member, sales were under a million dollars. And so we, we grew uh, really quickly over those next five years and, you know, still growing quite a bit. And it's been a it's been really fun and satisfying to not just um, create tastier <laughs> options <laughs> for dinner, but to take um, such a uh, uh, once again, a mission driven business and see it come to scale, see it widely adopted, you know, today. We're doing tests with McDonald's and uh, uh, and uh, Pizza Hut and and you know other national chains, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. So seeing this real whole movement um, sweep across the world has been really exciting. That's great, and that is still a founder-led uh, company. Yes, and, uh, yeah, which is. Yeah. Which is really great. Actually, I would love to get him to come on and share a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, Ethan's great. Get yeah. Ethan on here as well. He's I've met him a few times. He's really terrific. So then you co-founded Plant Burger uh, and co-founded Bethesda Green uh, before yeah. starting your your company that you're doing right now, Eat the Change. What inspired you besides, I mean, you were living this way, obviously. You yeah. wanted to uh, create plant-based snack foods, um, along the way. But what was, I mean, what was it that was really like, I got to go do this myself? Yeah, I'll tell you an interesting story. I haven't really talked about this, but I, um, uh, around 2020, this was before the whole pandemic, but just sort of toward the end of 2019, I did go through a process of thinking about what is the next stage of my life? What a career, what does that look like? And I, I actually did toy with going into politics. I was a government major in college. And so I sort of thought, oh, well, maybe that would be the right next step. And then I thought more about it and, and talked about it with my wife. And, um, you know, we thought about climate change being such a defining issue of our time. And, and when we think about if we ever had grandchildren, you know, when people look back, like, what were you doing at that moment? And um, especially seeing a lot of politics kind of just moving back and forth, but not really making impact. I thought, you know, it feels like the right next step for me personally is to go back, even, even though I could have used sort of the honesty transition and, and the, um, you know, I shifted at Beyond Meat from being chair, executive chair of the board to chair of the board, which means I'm not an officer of the company. It could have been the right moment to say, this is a transition where I will take that step into politics. But I said, no, it's, it's, it is the, the, the real next step is to, to go after climate um, issues in a more focused way. Because honesty, while it's certainly um, through organic ingredients has a, a clear climate commitment or environmental commitment, it isn't exclusively focused on climate. And so um, I had gotten approached a few years earlier. I had been on a food panel with um, Spike Mendelson, the chef, and like any good salesperson, I brought along some Beyond Burgers and some Honest Tea in a cooler bag. I snuck it under his chair. I said, you know, I'd love to have these in your stores. And he had he was carrying Honest Tea. And I didn't know that Spike's wife was a vegan. And so she loved the Beyond Burgers. And and he's, you know, Spike has cooked some of the best burgers in the world. You know, he's beat Bobby Flay. I mean, he's a he's a he's a <laughs> so uh, he cooked up Beyond Burgers in a way I'd never tasted them before. And I said, that is amazing. And so he said, well, let's create a restaurant called Plant Burger. I was like, wow, that's really exciting. I just have I've never launched a restaurant. I have no all I've done is seen restaurants, you know, go out of business. I don't know that that's for me. Um, but I introduced him and I was at the time conflicted because I was working at, at Coke and um, Beyond Meat. So I couldn't direct, get involved directly. But I my wife got involved and then our son got involved uh, as the head of marketing and um, our son came up with this phrase, eat the change you wish to see in the world. And for me, it was like, wow, 
that really encapsulates what I think it needs to happen. People need to think about what they eat and understand it is a climate decision. And so the more I got around that phrase, I thought, okay, well, um, I, I was happy to, um, I, through my transition with Beyond Meat, I was able to join uh, as Plant Burger as a founder. And then working with Spike and on the recipes, I said, there's, there's enough of an idea here and a creativity from a chef that we could create a business called Eat the Change. And the first step was just thinking about our purpose and what could we do around environment? How would we bring to life as a brand these concerns? And so then we, um, you know, I guess partially because we, during the pandemic, we couldn't, we knew we wouldn't, wasn't the right time to launch a business. We really thought hard about what would be the five areas, the guardrails for Eat the Change. And then we went after them. And so one, of course, is plant-based food, plant and fungi based food. One is organic ingredients. One is thinking about food waste. How do we make sure we're using crops that we can use the whole food? Like if we're, for our mushroom jerky, we'll use the stem. We'll use the bruised mushroom, the small mushroom, any whatever, oversized. Um, another, and then also looking at water footprint. How do we make sure our our, our Crops are not like almonds, which require over a thousand gallons of water to make a pound of a product. And then how do we ensure that this business represents uh, democratizing plant-based foods? The goal is not to just sell, you know, uh, planet-friendly foods to um, the wealthy or the highly educated. Let's make them available wherever we can at affordable price points and at distribution um, in, in a way that makes it accessible. That's incredible. And they're really, really good. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, especially I tried the carrot chews. Um, they're, yeah. yeah, they're super, super nice. And uh, we're really excited about them. And you can eat them too, knowing that, you know, you feel good about it. And I think that the other thing is you've done an incredible job just on the packaging and the marketing, just actually educating. And I think more and more people want to understand not only who's behind the brand, but they want to know a little bit about the brand. And I think the transparency and all of those things you just cover really, really well. What do you think you've worked? You're an entrepreneur yourself. Uh, you know, right. you've worked in large companies, you've been on boards, et cetera. What do you think is, as you're starting these new businesses, one or two things that you think are really the key things that entrepreneurs need to be focusing on? You've got a great idea, you've got a great product, but where does it fall off the rails? Where do you think, uh, like, you're counseling your your kids who are starting businesses, mm. or uh, yeah. you know, what? Where do you think is the the key thing? Is it investors? Is it marketing? Is it uh, yeah. getting into? I mean, one of the things that I've I said to somebody the other day that I noticed in building Hint is, you know, there's we had opportunities early on to be in Walmart. And we never believed, like if we went into Walmart too early, um, first of all, we didn't want to fail in, in right. Walmart, but we also believed that we hadn't been in other stores first. So there's like a, there's a, an yeah. order that goes on. Yeah. And I explain that to entrepreneurs all the time yeah. that, uh, you know, it's okay to say no sometimes to retailers if it's not, if you're not going to have enough SKUs, if you're not going to have, right. you know, the right arrangement in, in some way, but what would you say is sort of the thing that you look at when you're trying to advise companies and entrepreneurs? Yeah. I lean toward the consumer. I always, um, the voice of the consumer is what makes or breaks a business. And, and so I always want to feel like we've got the consumer on our side. One great example is, you know, with Beyond Meat, um, there was a few years ago when they actually still now, some um, interests, some, some of the meat interests were trying to restrict the way we could talk about our product. They said, well, you can't call it sausage because there's no dead animal in there, you know? Um, and of course you worry about that and you do try to, you know, do what you can to constrain that kind of legislation, which really is about restricting freedom of speech. Uh, but, but I always sort of knew that the consumer was on our side. Like if this is what consumers want, you can make me call it a, a bathtub, <laughs> whatever. But you know, the consumer. Uh, so addressing a consumer need to me is always the most critical piece. So, for example, with our our kids snack, um, the carrots, we we um, looked at the shelf and we saw um, that 
what was mostly selling in the lunchbox for kids are these fruit snacks, which aren't fruit at all. They're, they're called fruit snacks. And so, you know, um, and yet, you know, well, what would be the answer? Of course, maybe you just sell raw carrots. Well, that's not where the consumer is. You know, parents currently are buying more than a billion dollars worth of things packaged in a package, calling it fruit snacks, and it's empty calories. And so um, we had to find a solution that could basically function in the same way. It had to come in a package. It had to be five in a box. It had to work at, that a kid could, you know, open up a little pouch and be able to snack alongside their friends. Um, and that is what led, you know, obviously we found a way to make a, a much more nutritious snack. Our, our carrot snacks are made with carrots, not um, really. I was going to say fruit, but the fruit snacks aren't made with fruit. They're made with starch and tapioca. Um, and, and so it was important all along the way to keep in mind the consumer. And, and the other thing that's important, because of course, I know you share this as, as a mission-driven consumer, you want to always, you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And so um, on the one hand, we, we say, wow, it feels wasteful to have five different pouches. What if we just did a bulk package? But once again, that's not what the consumers wants. The, the parents buying this, they need those five little pouches. So one for each day of the week to put in the lunchbox. And if we ask the consumer to change too much of their behavior, if we say, okay, instead of buying fruit snacks, we're going to sell you carrots. But instead of selling it to you in five pouches, we're going to sell you a bulk bag and ask you to, you know, then we lose them. And so we've got to find, we've got to make it as accessible as we can. The same with Beyond Meat, right? We've got to make sure our product is a burger that behaves on a, a patty the same way. It, unlike the veggie burgers of the past, it has to hold up in a grill. It can't fall apart. And it still has to sizzle and it still has to give up. Literally, what is the noise of the sizzling of a Beyond Burger? And if I close my eyes and, I, and I'm, grill, you know, if I'm grilling a, a beef burger and a Beyond Burger, do they sound the same? And the color transformation, all these things that are, are part of the consumer experience. And so I always let that guide product design and, and thinking. Yeah. And I think paying attention to the consumer constantly and, and no matter what channel they're getting your product in either. So right. how, what's your feeling on direct to consumer, obviously, uh, you know, oh, when you yeah. started honest versus <laughs> uh, where it is today. I mean, what's your, what's yeah. your feeling on that? Oh, it's an amazing new opportunity. Yeah. For honesty, it just wasn't something that was around when we started. And then of course being so much in glass bottles, it was, even if we could do it, it would be really heavy and, and obviously worrying about breakage. And then with Beyond Meat, because the product's refrigerated and you have to worry about dry ice. Um, but today it's totally different. And of course, now with our mushroom jerky, which is in a packet and our uh, carrot juice, we can do more direct. So we hope to get there. Right now, we've just been scrambling to make enough for the retail shelf. Um, so I really admire what you've done at Hint. It's incredible how much direct business you have. And I, I believe we will get there, but um, we knew for our product, we wanted to at least um, make a, a presence in retail first, and then you know, we'll build out that direct over time. But it's, it's exciting to, to see what you can do in terms of having that direct relationship with a consumer, to be able to get their feedback, to um, learn their behaviors so much more. So I'm looking forward to that part of the business. Yeah, definitely. It was game changing, I think, for Hint. I mean, having yeah. that direct to consumer business. And, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book I wrote, Undaunted, is that, you know, when things happen along the way, and they will, you'll have uh, challenges. Um, our challenge was at Starbucks when Starbucks decided to change strategy and put more food mm. in the case. They had to make yeah. room um, for the food. And, you know, they very politely said, it's not you, it's us. And, you know, you guys are doing great. Um, but, yeah. you know, it was it was suddenly we were faced with a situation where that was that huge chunk of business for us was going to be going away. And as I always say to entrepreneurs, it's like if you don't spread out what you're doing when one of those when somebody changes strategy and you're not going to be a part of that strategy anymore. Yeah. Having your own direct to consumer business where you can alert the consumer to the fact that you're no longer available in Starbucks, but they can still find you on mm. your website or they can, yeah. you know, go to these other retailers. It actually puts a lot of um, control 
back in your hands when these situations happen that you really can't do anything about it. Um, so yeah. I think it's it's a powerful uh, tool for all entrepreneurs in every industry to have. You know, we even have a form of that at Plant Burger because we have an app. And so we have that ability to have direct connections with our consumers. And, and so we, to the extent we can, you know, some of these eating uh, delivery services are super expensive. And so when we can interconnect with them on the app, we have the chance to gain a little more uh, direct relationship. And so that's also really powerful. That's awesome. So I'd love to hear a story where you had a challenge or a failure in all of these businesses that you've been uh, starting or co-founding and helping. I mean, what was one where you felt like, oh, this is this is a bad one. I don't know if we're going to get out of here. And what did you learn? Oh, my goodness. So many. Well, certainly the bottling plant is the one that's most emblazoned on me just because it's, um, you know, it was such a challenge. It was a, such a long period of time. But I think probably the the one that I'm, uh, I still keep with me is the first time I had to fire somebody. And um, that, that was a really um, challenging moment. And I, I, I don't um, certainly never like to have to fire anybody. Um, but I will say that doing it, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I, if I ever have, to, if, as I've had to do it, I've gotten much better at it. And I think it's really important to do it well for the person and for you know, um, certainly for the company. And uh, this was super early on at Honest Tea's evolution. We had a, a, a sales leader. We only had two salespeople. And one of them um, just was really super um, distracted. He, he was going through a terrible time personally. And, you know, in retrospect now, what it would probably have been right is have him take a leave of absence um, and, and sort things out. But it was literally like the worst case scenario for someone where, uh, his wife had an affair with a priest and got pregnant. And it was just a, a sort of a horrific series of events. And, but he did, he, uh, I only found out about this sort of afterward. And so in the middle, I just like, I just, he's just not doing his job. And, and, and as such a small company, we don't have the resources to, um, you know, just sort of carry somebody. And so it, I did fire him, um, and I did it on a Friday. And over that weekend, I got a call from his brother. He had a heart attack uh, and was in the hospital. So I just felt horrible. Um, you know, what's nice at the end is that he actually recovered and went on to do great things. And I'm, quite, I'm still quite friendly with him. Um, but, but that was just such a brutal time. And, and along the way, I just, um, I wasn't as firm as I needed to be. And so you know, clarity and um, clean decision making becomes a really important skill. And, you know, like any on any startup entrepreneur, there were those were skills I, I had not fully developed. Um, so that that was certainly a challenge. Two things mm -hmm. come to mind when you say that. And I totally agree with you that when you allow people like that to stay in your organization, it filters, right? It's uh, That's throughout right. the rest of the organization and That's you right. allow people who are not coming in and giving 100% into the situation yeah. for sure. It sounds like you allowed somebody to go and do something that they were meant to go do, right? And maybe yeah. have a wake-up yeah, call. It was, better, it was a better decision for him too at the end of the day. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Seth, for all of this wisdom and all of your stories. And oh, it's so fun to be with you. Yeah. Everyone order from eatthechange.com and uh, definitely give the carrots and the mushrooms. And I know there's other products coming out as well. They're really, really incredible. And of course, still support Honest and uh, Beyond Meat and <laughs> definitely go to Plant Burger as well. And uh, all things that Seth is doing. And we really, really appreciate you coming on. Where do people follow you, Seth? Oh, yeah. So I'm on Twitter, Honest Seth, and on LinkedIn as well. And of course, uh, Eat the Changes across all the platforms. Incredible. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. And don't forget to subscribe to The Kara Golden Show, where you hear amazing interviews from great creators like Seth Goldman. And please be sure to give everybody uh, or everybody should give this episode five stars because those algorithms love five star ratings and it just boosts Seth's episode up a lot more or this 
podcast is now trending globally as one of the number one entrepreneurial podcasts and uh, incredible leaders like Seth and creators like Seth can be found on our show. So I really, really appreciate uh, you coming on, Seth, for sure. And definitely, as I mentioned in the podcast, pick up a copy of Undaunted, my book. It's also on Audible, too. And we are here every Monday, Wednesday, and we're actually launching another day on Friday because we've got so many incredible entrepreneurs that we want to talk to. And thank you again for supporting the show. And thank you, Seth. And have a wonderful week.